Welcome back to the Movie Bevel Podcast. Today I'm hosting. It's uh, me, Brennan. I'm here with Nick. How's it going? It's going well. Just sitting at home, doing nothing, watching some movies, <laughs> passing the time, making it work. Yeah, I know for sure. And I think that, um, as, as I pointed out to Colin last week, before we jump in here, I just really hope that a lot of people now have some downtime. Uh, I know it's, it's a very stressful time. It's a scary time. But it'll be great for a lot of people to hopefully explore um, a lot of movies that they they wouldn't normally watch. Uh, I think that's one positive we could maybe see in, in this. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a few things that I've learned in, since all this craziness has started. It's one, I'm definitely sleeping a lot more <laughs> just because of no more commutes to work and everything like that, which is great. And yeah, two is I'm definitely starting to kind of make a dent in a lot of those movies that um, I've just been kind of been putting off seeing for the longest time. Like I finally put my money where my mouth is and I bought the Criterion channel. So started to get through that. So yeah, it's all over the place. I watched like five movies yesterday. I just like sat on my couch and just watched stuff. Um, so I guess I'm pretty fortunate to only have to worry about that, but um, it's, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm making the most of it. I can't, I can't complain too much. Yeah, for sure. And things are, things are good there. Yeah. I mean, so I'm back in DC, which is kind of, I mean, New York is probably the worst of it all by far, but DC area is not great either. So I'm trying to just stay safe and whatnot. And it's, it is kind of crazy because this is my, I've been away for a while, but being back in the city, it's just, it's kind of eerie watching people. There's so many masks around now, which I guess is considered a good thing because there's more kind of circulation of those, but just seeing how many, the, like the number of masks and when people are walking on sidewalks, people like will just go out of their way to get out, to get onto the grass or anything like that, just to avoid people at all costs and socially and social distance. So um, it's definitely, it's kind of really setting in. I feel like for a lot of people now is somewhat of a new normal. Um, I mean, hopefully it only lasts until the end of April as um, the U S government has kind of said and things like that. But um it's it's definitely settling in for a lot of people, it seems like. Definitely, no, for sure. And uh, it's important, social distancing. Um, so we'll get into our first topic of the day, which really is, we still have a halted box office. Nothing's really going on. But uh, a few weeks ago, we saw a lot of films kind of get postponed. Uh, a lot of release dates kind of get lifted. Now we're seeing a lot of these movies now kind of come back down and find their release dates. The first one uh, we're going to talk about today is uh, Top Gun Maverick, um, which has now been rescheduled for uh, a Christmas release slot in December. Um, what do you make of this? I think personally, before you jump in, I, I, I think this just screams kind of like a nice summer movie, nice sunny day. Uh, I don't know. It just it, It'll be weird to have this sort of thing come out in uh, December, but that's uh, just where we're at. Yeah, it's when you I mean when you think of Top Gun, like one of the first things you think of is the just the bizarre beach scene when they're playing volleyball and Tom Cruise is all oiled up and there's so much homoeroticism going on. <laughs> like that's that's kind of one of the first things you think about with Top Gun. So it, it being not in summer anymore is just very bizarre, but hey, I get it. And like Paramount is one of those uh, studios that we've kind of talked about for a really long, really long time as they've been just struggling for the longest time and they really need to take good care of kind of their bigger uh, properties that are that kind of look like they're going to be big time box office successes so I mean you can't blame it at all for this and I mean I guess if it's not going to be a summer release I guess Christmas makes sense because it's more of like a big time event thing and there's no Star Wars or anything like that and it's it's not great I would have loved to see more 80s callback cheesiness in the summer but you, you can't fault them for anything at this point yeah no no for sure I, i'm I, I was thinking maybe they'd even push it back a whole year but i guess they want to try to keep things in line as much as possible and not rejig the schedule too too much however there is a pretty significant rejigging in the schedule for marvel um what we're seeing for marvel now with their new confirmed release dates is that they're pretty much pushing um everything back at least one slot so we had uh, originally this year black widow was supposed to be coming out may 4th and the eternals in november instead we're going to be seeing a shift where we have eternals in february um black widow now in november and i believe the uh 2020 marvel films uh getting pushed back uh, sorry 2021 marvel films um getting pushed back a slot as well to make room for uh, this shift um this is a smart move for sure uh, I'm really happy that they're not going the streaming route with Black Widow. Um, with Onward, it was kind of complicated. I mean, it makes sense that they drop it here on uh, uh, that Disney drops it on uh, the streaming service as they did a couple of days ago. 
But uh, Black Widow, I, I really, I, I don't want to see these blockbusters get dropped on streaming. I think that sets a a kind of awkward precedent. So um, I, I'm happy that they're doing this. Yeah, and Marvel just for being such a great, well-oiled machine as it is now, like they they're a really good they, they do a really good job of like planting their flag so early. So they're like, hey, we have this untitled Marvel movie for 2027. We don't we don't know what it is yet, but it's happening. Uh, and so they do that a lot and they can easily just shift back all these dates and just, just make it work really easily for them. So, um, I mean, we're seeing other studios like, I don't like Sony just pushing everything back. They're just like, fuck it. We don't want to deal with this at all. So all the big things we had coming out this year, like, sorry, you're going to have to wait. Um, and same thing with like fast and furious just coming out, uh, is coming out really late i mean that was announced a few weeks ago but that's still kind of just bizarre to me that they're like yeah we'll just wait a whole year um which but we're gonna see that for a lot of stuff um so it's just i guess it's just really fortuitous that marvel uh plans this stuff out so like far in advance that they can i mean it's not obviously it's not a great situation but they cannot they can afford to kind of rejigger their system a little bit definitely i i was actually i kind of uh prompted this question towards Colin last week. I was thinking that it might be smart, depending on how um, bad things get or, or how uh, difficult it seems to, to kind of stop that curve. I was thinking about studios pushing everything back a year, 2020 releases all to 2021, 2021 all to 2022. Now, fortunately, it doesn't seem like that is going to be necessary, but would, would that be something that you would uh, be opposed to? I mean, I know it would suck as a fan, but is, is that do you think that's something that studios would ever consider? Yeah, I think it's we're at this weird place where I don't think we've quite figured out the like the streaming or VOD release system yet. I think like The Hunt and Onward and The Invisible Man and all those movies that were at the beginning of this coronavirus like craziness and had a little bit of time in theaters and then were dumped on like streaming. I think for like twenty bucks or, or something like that. Um, I feel like. Those were kind of like the the guinea pigs, and we'll see this week as well because Trolls World Tour is kind of day and date. Um, I don't think any theaters are still open, but so that movie is going to be available for streaming. I think on April tenth. Um, so I feel like if we had, if all these studios had a better sense of what's the best way to kind of package all this stuff and figure out that price range, I feel like you would definitely see a lot more of these movies just kind of go straight to VOD. Um, but we don't have that yet, and maybe this kind of coronavirus stuff is kind of it's going to really put that into forward motion here. I've kind of been wondering what like the coronavirus is going to do for like just work and like the industry in general moving forward. Like I think a lot more people, a lot more people are definitely going to work remotely full time after this and things like that. Um, and I think one of the big things is that uh, VOD platform kind of kind of coming into um, its own there. But uh, I don't I don't necessarily mind it. Um, I think with all the movies that have kind of pushed back to even later this year, I like once all this starts to die down, hopefully um, we're just like, and I'll be running around like crazy in the fall, just seeing like, there's already like double the amount of movies, right? It's because you have like things just kind of make, hoping to make some box office money. And then you kind of have all the award stuff coming out. So it feels like you'll have like triple the amount of movies coming out with everything pushed back from the spring and summer. Uh, so I don't really mind it in terms of <laughs> just my work, <laughs> my workload, but maybe that's a little selfish, but um, I don't know. What do you think? Um, I, th I think that as a collective, it'd be, it'd be difficult, obviously, for the entire industry to shift uh, a whole year. But I think it, it's something that if we did see this virus continue to go deep into the summer, um, which which who knows what's going to happen at this point, I think that that's something that they should consider maybe doing an entire shift, uh, like all the major studios kind of collectively agreeing on that. Um, however, you're right. I think there is we, we, the VOD and, and streaming kind of release for some of these bigger films. We don't know how that like like we don't have a, really a, a grip or a handle on that yet. There were the guinea pigs, as you said, a few weeks ago with the Invisible Man, the hunt and whatnot. Um, but I just I, I still at this point can't picture major blockbusters getting dropped on streaming. And, and we saw uh, rumors of Wonder Woman 84 that that was going to get dropped on streaming in uh, May or June. But uh, the studio, uh, Warner Bros., uh, denied those rumors, and they announced an August uh, release date for that film. So I just feel like some of the bigger blockbusters, I, I still think they're going to try to stray away from that uh, sort of uh, streaming or, or VOD release. Um, but it, it'll be neat to see the further implications that, that this has on 
not only the film industry, but just the entire globe. And I, I, I think that we will be feeling some major ramifications when this all uh, ends um, in, in many different sectors of society. Yeah, and cause it's like the scary thing and also kind of like the weird part of it is that we don't like, right, like because of the curve and everything, we don't know exactly when everything's going to go back to normal, normal, like when all of us are like going out and and go to big sporting events and concerts with big crowds. Like, like, I don't know, like, I feel like if like, like our world's leaders come out in July and say, Hey, everything's great. We're fine. And like, we don't have like a cure or anything like that. Like if I go to like a theater and like a big crowd and someone coughs like behind me, like I'm still going to be like a little worried, you know, like I'll be, that'll be in the back of my mind until we have some sort of cure. Like just that's being like just tossed out to everyone around the world. So um, I think it's definitely, even though like if things are like kind of back to normal in July, I like, I can't really see things really like going back to where we were in maybe like February or something like that when we weren't thinking about this until like maybe like February of 2021. Like I can't, I really can't say there. It's, it's just, it's so bizarre. And I think everyone kind of got blown back on um, their heels with this because it's just, it's so unprecedented, like ever since like what, like the Spanish flu in 1918, right? So Mm -hmm. like, like no one really knows how to deal with this. And I think we're going to see so many different changes. And I think you might see like, movies that were moved to later this year, they might get moved back again to 2021. So um, I think it's just one of those things where we just kind of have to look at everything as we go week by week. Cause I think a lot of theaters and theater chains and studios are going to kind of, are going to change uh, what they want to do. So um, it's, it's very, very weird. Yeah. And what I think is probably the most likely uh, of events is you have so many different timelines being thrown out there. People saying a few months, people saying even uh, up to 12 months and more of of this sort of scenario still playing out, which is uh, pretty crazy to think about. We don't want to talk about that too much, but um, I think what we'll probably see is a slow immersion back to where we were in the sense of maybe theaters will only do half capacity at the first little bit. Maybe restaurants will only seat every other table. Uh, Maybe stores will only let in a certain amount of people at a time. Like we might slowly see an easing back, but um, we really don't know. It's it's just too early. And I think we're we're too much in, um, in kind of the peak of, of, of all this going on. I think we're kind of in the mix of it way too much that, that we can't even, begin to think about where the after is um but uh we'll see what happens and movie babble will still be there i pump it out the podcasts every week <laughs> um <laughs> yes, no, matter we will. How, uh, no matter how dry the uh, box office remains to be and um we'll move forward here though because a few other films got moved um mulan actually got uh, a release date now they're supposed to come out in march uh now we have the end of july so that i think is a hopeful date for disney there but I think we uh, have to be on the cautious side with that one. Uh, And then Jungle Cruise, the Dwayne Johnson and Emily Blunt, a Disney film that they're kind of hoping to be like their next, not like Pirates of the Caribbean in the terms of of what it is as a uh, franchise um, and kind of genre, but kind of stemming from that, like based off a Disney ride type sort of thing. And they wanted to spawn a big franchise that was originally going to come out in July. Now it's getting pushed to July of next year. So as you said, movies getting pushed back to next year it's happening for sure um now a film that's not really it's a blockbuster for some it's definitely a a, a major blockbuster on kind of the awards side of films but not a, a multi-billion dollar blockbuster by any means is the french dispatch film that we're all excited for it was set to come out in july uh wes anderson's the french dispatch but it has been pushed to october 16th that to me seems like a much more appropriate time for a movie like this but i was looking forward to seeing it the week after tenet i thought that would have been cool but uh, seeing it in october is uh, uh good as well yeah it actually makes a lot of sense to me kind of what you were saying there where um we know that like right the oscars are for the entire year in film but like most of the stuff really comes out like october maybe like the last few weeks in september but really that october through december range so like stuff that comes out in like the su- in like the summer like you you have like your once upon a time in hollywoods and things like that but i don't think the french dispatch was ever going to get close to that kind of box office hall or kind of just general like intrigue so i think like this is actually weirdly a, like a, like an improvement for french dispatch i think especially because the oscars might be so weird this year and who knows maybe we even get some kind of weird provision this year where they're like yeah streaming movies can are 
are kind of eligible for all these awards. I don't really know, but I think that's kind of like a sort of like a sexy time period for Oscar stuff that middle of October. Or so, um, and yeah, it's a Wes Anderson movie it has like everyone in Hollywood is in that movie. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it weirdly, it's kind of like that kind of could be like one of like the winners in all this, if there even is a winner, but I don't know. It's, it's, I think it's, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, funny that you, you talked about that, uh, the Academy maybe changing uh, the rules for this year. And I did see reports that they were starting to uh, talk about adjusting that because you need a, you need to have seven consecutive days at a theater to be qualified for the Oscars. Um, There has already been talk about them adjusting that, maybe cutting the days down from seven to something even smaller than that, or just allowing streaming. So they actually have started to uh, have those sorts of discussions for this year. Um, But kind of a weird thing. And I like, one of the weird things that I hope to see at the Oscars this year is just movies that don't really, uh, quote unquote, not, not in my opinion, but movies that traditionally don't belong. <laughs> I'd love to see some of them sneak <laughs> in there and get a little bit of representation. I think that would be funny and, uh, kind of neat. Um, but, uh, we'll see how it goes and we'll see how this thing plays out. Yeah. I think it's, that's kind of one of the things I mentioned earlier about like, what are the long-term ramifications of the coronavirus and like what, changes will just occur in all industries and and i think i mean we could all kind of see like maybe like the streaming influence on the oscars was probably going to happen at some time maybe it was like maybe full time it would be like 20 years from now and maybe not next year um so maybe the the this, all this disease stuff has kind of just accelerated that time clock a little bit um but it yeah it's it'll be really interesting i i kind of hope that a lot of these Maybe this causes them to maybe have Elizabeth Moss for Best Actress in The Invisible Man, which would be kind of cool. And that's obviously like kind of like a hard horror sci-fi thing that they would normally never like. They would probably just scoff at that and look at whatever like Tom Hooper is doing next or whatever. Um, but it's it'll be I think that's it's just another thing. It's just another kind of thing to like keep keep an eye on for all this because it's that like this is gonna be a weird year you might see some really crazy winners come oscar time or just some really insane nominees like (laughs) all this stuff is going to be very strange yeah no for sure um and just kind of touching on the last few films that uh kind of adjusted their release dates we have the uh the sequel to minions minions rise of Gru. so they're just continuing to expand this despicable me universe <laughs> um <laughs> no, that God. that actually also i believe got bumped to next year as well uh originally it was going to come out early summer i think june um of this year so that has been bumped to next year as well originally they just had a, the release date lifted they didn't have anything confirmed yet but that's next year and then a quiet place part two uh, which was supposed to come out, I think, on the uh, 18th, I believe, two weeks ago, um, uh, around there. We we now have it coming out in the first weekend of September. I think this is a smart time to release it. We saw that it, uh, or we saw that horror films going to have success. We saw it have great success at the beginning of September. Even it, Chapter Two, well, it didn't turn box office numbers like the first one. It still made well over 500 uh, million dollars worldwide, which is quite a lot. So I think A Quiet Place Part Two getting uh, a release around there a little bit closer to October definitely a smart move for this one kind of like French Dispatch it kind of just makes sense yeah and for Minions like I like that movie's already a meme so whatever but um, <laughs> it's it's it, it's interesting because we're seeing a lot of these movies that were already just finished who are just getting just put on the shelf again but I'm pretty sure Minions um, they just they were in the middle of just post-production kind of just finishing all the animation and they couldn't obviously finish it because of all of the stuff going on so I think that's that. I think that was a lot of the reason why they had to push that back because they just needed more time to fix everything up. But um, yeah, the Quiet Place that makes a lot of sense too, right? Yeah, like you mentioned, it and it chapter two, um, and typically that time period is kind of like one of the more quieter times because I feel like there's there's always like a big final uh, release like the first weekend of August. I think last year was Hobbs and Shaw, and then after that there's just kind of nothing um, up until right around that first weekend in September. Um, so I feel like that makes sense as them for them to kind of like plant their flag. Uh, so, I mean, we'll see kind of, I imagine that that kind of dead zone will be a little more populated with stuff now. Cause I, yeah, like you said, Wonder Woman is in kind of later August, I believe. So I'm sure it's not going to be as quite of like a, just a easy ramp for it to just make a ton of money. But, um, that's, I think that makes a lot of sense for that movie. Yeah, definitely. Um, and 
now transitioning kind of out of the release date. So that's a good sign. We're seeing some movies uh, now actually get dates. Um, let's move into some Netflix talk because we've been doing this the last few weeks talking about um, what's trending on Netflix. It's a neat new edition. Um, tell me what's the top 10 in the U.S. because, you know, we it's a country of over 300 million people down there that you're in. And it's uh, a lot of uh, a lot of people streaming Netflix. So what's what's trending right now? Yeah, United States kind of big. Um, <laughs> so we'll look through the top 10. So number one is uh, Coffee and Kareem, which is the the kind of the big uh, Netflix release of the week, which is a horrible movie. I guess we'll <laughs> we'll talk about that later, but I just did not, did not like that movie. Um, number two is the most 2011 movie ever made, which is The Roommate, starring uh, Leighton Meester and Minka Kelly. And I think uh, Billy Zane's in there somewhere. So just fantastic stuff. Uh, number three is Angel Has Fallen. Uh the third movie in the Has Fallen franchise with good old Gerard Butler just continuing to fall <laughs> and save uh, presidents and whatnot. Uh, four is The Players Club. Uh, five is The Hangover, which I believe just came back to Netflix on US. It was, I think it was there, I think like last year or sometime, and then it left, and then now it's back. So um, that movie always does pretty well what's on the service. And then uh, Salt, the uh, Angelina Jolie thriller from. 2010 i remember kind of liking that movie kind of feeling like that was like a great like on tv on tnt kind of movie to watch um then next you have road to perdition uh, and then after that is money heist the phenomenon which I, I think is the documentary based on the, the quietly like big time tv show for netflix uh, and then after that it's blood father and then 10 is the perks of being a wallflower um and so kind of just it's kind of bizarre it's always an eclectic group here um I feel like it's definitely less uh, Netflix heavy than it has been in the last few weeks. But um, yeah, how about the how about the Canadian top ten? Do you have anything information there? Yeah. So actually, with you uh, kind of telling me the ones that you have there, we seem to have a very different uh, slate um, on Netflix right now. A lot of different movies on here, but Coffee and Kareem is number one. So I guess that's reigning supreme worldwide, uh, for better or for most certainly worse. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But uh, just kind of going through, we have Tom Cruise's Jack Reacher at two, uh, G.I. Joe Retaliation at three. These are two films that just got dumped onto the streaming service. Uh, She's Out of My League, which also just got dropped, uh, is number four. Money Heist, uh, The Phenomenon, which is a documentary Netflix one, that's number five. We got White Chicks at six, which also is another film that just got dropped on. Um, uh, uh, Life of the Party, number seven, which was first last week. That also was a newer release so a lot of it's just kind of trendy new releases that are getting jumped on here uh like new to the service um and there's also a netflix original film that is a a quebec movie so it really makes sense that that's here that's the decline it was a little bit higher last week but it's eight right now uh we own the night is at nine and then denzel washington's flight is at 10 so a lot of these films are kind of just movies that are a little bit newer to the service you're right it's not quite as netflix heavy there's still a few in there especially that one uh canadian uh, netflix film but uh for the most part it's just a coffee and cream weekend <laughs> yeah that movie's terrible <laughs> it's so so bad so it's one of the i had a really good saturday so yesterday i watched five movies um, just really good stuff. Some classic movies. I finally bought the Criterion Channel, and I'm just go- sifting through all this great stuff. I I went back to back. I saw I watched Eraserhead for the first time, then Agira, The Wrath of God, and I'm just like, oh, this is great. Uh, and then at night, I put on Coffee and Cream, and it was just like the worst thing. <laughs> it was just like an awful way to end my uh, day. And it's it's remember do you, do you remember that movie Stuber that came out last year? Remember that mm-hmm. movie? It's yep. the same director, Michael Douse, and he likes to do a lot of these sort of buddy crime cop things. Like they're just they're kind of high energy and kind of crazy, and a lot of bullets fly. And um, I actually didn't mind Stuber, even though I kind of like dunk on it because it's just like such a stupid title and it just didn't really <laughs> it didn't really do anything. So it's just kind of funny to make fun of it, even though I enjoyed parts of it. Um, but yeah, the coffee and cream is terrible. So it stars Ed Helms, um, Taraji P Henson is in there. Uh, Betty Gilpin is in there um, and it's they I can't remember the kid's name, but it's basically you, you put together um, Ed Helms is a cop in Detroit and he's dating Taraji P. Henson um, and his and Taraji P. Henson's son just does not like him because he's a cop and everything. And they get put together. Um, he has to drive him home one day and it leads to like this crazy underground conspiracy where they're running around and it's tied to 
the cops and all that. Um, it's just not very good. It's it's just one of the, one of those movies that tries to juxtapose like, oh, let's have this throw this innocent kid in here, but he's super crass and everything is so vulgar, um, which I like sometimes. I think it's just a really hard tone to hit, and if you don't hit it, it's just very obnoxious and not fun. And that's just what I felt through this entire movie. Uh, I don't really, I don't like Ed Helms as a leading man very often. I think he's really good as this a side character because i think his stick he kind of plays the same version of himself and everything you know whether it's like the office or the hangover it's basically the same guy um and i feel like that that persona is a lot better in a supporting role um but here yeah he's just like unleashed and just doing his thing the whole time and it's just so unfunny um so i can't i can't really recommend this movie at all uh betty gilpin's really great in it um i still have yet to check out the hunt because i don't feel like paying 20 bucks for it on streaming but apparently she's really good in that as a kind of insane character she's really insane in this movie too and she almost saves it at times she's really really funny um and just kind of unhinged to just doing whatever she feels like on screen and it's hilarious but um yeah other than that uh just don't watch coffee and cream just try the criterion channel maybe do the <laughs> team day um free trial that they give you just try something there just it's just so much more worth your time <laughs> um quickly just talking about ed helms as the leading man uh, have you ever seen the movie the clapper no but that's been staring me in the face on the netflix like home screen for like for months to the point where i'm like i might watch this at some point <laughs> it's, it's it's easily um easily one of the worst movies i've seen uh <laughs> but but it, it's it's weirdly enough in the same vein of joker oh interesting that's really all i'm gonna say but you watch it it's it's bad but it's it's easy to laugh at and it's a decent time if you're doing that <laughs> um but isn't he uh, a, isn't he like a he's like an audience member like he's a professional audience member is that what it is yeah yeah, and there's a lot of there's a lot of him getting put down throughout the movie, and I just see the parallels with Joker. It's it's a uh, <laughs> it's it, it was just kind of funny to watch. I I, I don't know. It's it's I, I feel like no one's seen it. I I think when I logged it on my letterbox, there were like a couple hundred people that had logged it. <laughs> so uh, it's an unseen film, and uh, it's uh, it's a hidden uh, it's a hidden gem of sorts if you're looking for bad movies. <laughs> isn't isn't Amanda Seyfried in that as well? I believe she is. Right? Yep, she is. It's, I can't uh, wait. I can't wait for the the Clapper Joker uh, crossover. Joker yeah, two. It's... Joker two. The Clapper coming twenty twenty one. Great stuff. Oh my. Oh my god. Um, it's de- they're definitely in the same universe and in another alternate uh, alternate dimension. I want um, to watch but, it now. Dunk on it. This is great. <laughs> uh, I, I'm all for that. Go for it. Um, but yeah, so kind of just moving away from the Netflix uh, releases, I think we we pointed out earlier, Onward got dumped on Disney+. Plus. That was something that kind of surprised me because I was expecting them to maybe re-release it uh, in theaters to try to make as much coin as they could because it only had about a week and a half or two weeks in theaters before all this coronavirus uh, stuff to, uh, shut everything down. But it was nice of uh, Disney to throw that on there, and that's something that I didn't get a chance to see in theaters, so I'm going to be watching it hopefully with the family uh uh, pretty soon um but tell me some other things that got released this week on streaming yeah so i've been kind of just sort of like through all this time kind of trying to ch- the check in on all the, the kind of the smaller movies that have been coming out the past few weeks and kind of w- trying to watch them and support them a little more um so uh i caught up with the platform a little while ago which was kind of the big buzzy netflix movie about kind of in the vein of cube where it's they're stuck in this vertical prison, right? And it's just a really big old metaphor for uh, class inequality because there's food, there's like a bunch of levels in this prison, right? And then they have a bunch of food that should feed everybody uh, that passes through each level. But um, obviously people at the top just take too much for themselves. And uh, when you're at the bottom, they literally have to cannibalize each other. So it's it's kind of fun. Um, I just didn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't a huge fan of this movie. It's pretty entertaining to watch, but I just think it's just, it's just so unsubtle, subtle, and I mean, I don't really, I don't mind about, I don't mind it being unsubtle. I think like even Parasite's not particularly subtle, but there's a way of doing it that I don't think the movie that performs pretty well. It's pretty muddled. Um, but 
I think the movie, kind of the two movies I really want to focus on are uh, Big Time Adolescence, which is the, the Hulu movie that came out a few weeks ago, and another movie that I'll, I'll mention later, which is releasing in the, in the next few weeks, which I'm kind of excited about because I think it could be a fun VOD horror movie. But um, a Big Time Adolescence, uh, so it premiered at Sundance, I think, last year. Uh, it's Pete Davidson, um, and it's Griffin Gluck, I think, is the main character. But it's basically... Uh, Pete Davidson plays like an updated uh, Matthew McConaughey from uh, Days and Confused, except a lot less fun. <laughs> he's just he's just this 23 year old. Um, he used to date Griffin Gluck's uh, daughter. But they stopped dating. Uh, those two remain friends. And we fast forward a couple years later, uh, and they're still hanging out. And Pete Davidson's uh, I think his name is, his character's name is Zeke. He's just kind of just doing nothing, just smoking weed all day. He 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 just kind of quits his job because he doesn't feel like working. Uh, it's really good. I feel like it's like one of the first movies sort of to um, kind of understand Pete Davidson and his like personality. He's really good in this movie. I think he's the reason you should watch this movie because you've seen this so many times before where it's like, oh, yeah, like the kid hangs out with someone older than him. Right. And he, he doesn't really understand kind of the negative influences that are causing that are being caused in his life. And he gets into just all his bad stuff and he starts selling drugs and at parties and it's you've seen this story so many times and there's nothing it doesn't quite add anything new to that conversation necessarily but i think just watching pete davidson do his thing in this movie is so good um and john crier plays griffin gluck's dad um john crier two and a half men fame and i i like this is the best i haven't seen a lot of his older movies that he did when he was a lot of like before he got really into tv but i feel like this is like one of the best uses of him in a movie i think he's terrific as the dad, he just wants to punch Zeke in the face <laughs> for so long in this movie. Um, it's really, he's really terrific here. And I think uh, those two guys are kind of why this movie's worth watching. Um, but the last movie that I kind of wanted to focus on here was uh, this movie. It it's, comes out in May and it's called The Wretched. Or The Wretched? The Wretched? I think it's The Wretched. Anyway, um, it's a really fun uh, 80s like summer camp uh, throwback horror movie. And it's it's basically it's playing on this idea of kind of uh, familial distress or divorce, and the monster is basically a manifestation of like all the anger and uh, that these kind of like these distressed families have for each other. Um, so it's a pretty good metaphor, but a lot of it is just like it's a really fun throwback to all of those '80s movies that you love, where people are just dying near a summer camp, and this this time it's at a uh, uh, like a little dock, a little boating dock um, out in the country. Um, and it's really fun because it's it, it's kind of like it's sort of an invasion of the body snatchers kind of thing where the monster is kind of taking over these people and you don't quite know. I mean, you you figure it out, but there's you don't quite know what's going on with some of these people uh, at, at times. Um, it's really fun and there's a really good um, lead performance in here by I think his name is John Paul Howard. I had never seen him in a movie before, but he's terrific and he's a young guy to look out for. Um, so yeah, those are kind of a few movies that I would really recommend. Uh, I also reviewed uh, this movie called Inside the Rain on on the site earlier this week. I think is a really interesting movie that I don't think a lot of people will love because I don't really like it in terms of what it's doing on screen, but I think it kind of goes into the mind of its its director really thoughtfully. So I would I would be on the lookout for those if you're looking, if you're not trying to watch a bunch of movies from like 1960 or something like that. <laughs> if you're looking for new stuff, I think those movies are worth checking out. And uh, Inside the Rain, where, where's that uh, going to be? Is that just going to be a VOD type thing? Or? So I believe it's already – you can you can watch it for free on Tubi right now. Okay. Um, yeah. I think it's available on Amazon Prime and other things like that. But I guess I'll give a little more background on it. It's So the director of this movie is Aaron Fisher, and he suffers from bipolar disorder and ADHD, OCD, just a lot of different things, a lot of uh, neurological things going on. Um and so he wrote this movie where it's incredibly meta. It's about his, it's basically about his life. The events in it don't really ha happen, but it's a lot of, uh, it's based on a lot of his issues in college and trying to deal with his um, illness and everything like that. And he stars in the movie as well. And Rosie Perez and Eric Roberts are in there. Rosie Perez plays his, um, his therapist and she has a, she's just good at being Rosie Perez and Eric Roberts is just good at being him himself as well. Um, this movie is really rough, and I don't mean that in terms of like the subject matter is tough to get through. Like it's just 
you watch it and you just it's just not a very like clean finished product and i think a lot of people <laughs> will like hear my recommendation for this movie and they'll go watch it and they'll be like uh, like well, this guy doesn't know anything like this movie <laughs> looks so amateurish um and i i totally agree and i totally understand with uh, with that but the thing i get really interested in is like this is i don't know if this is considered like outsider art but like this is a lot of it's a very strange way um, because the lead uh, Aaron Aaron Fisher, he delivers his lines very deadpan and bluntly. Like he doesn't quite like have the typical emotion in in scenes that you would like think that a normal actor would have during those scenes. But it's a lot of him just when you, when you get down to the core of it, it's a lot of him just kind of dealing with his um, kind of his mental state and calling out for understanding and having a lot of frustration with, just like society in general. And he, and a lot of the movies he can't quite, you can tell he can't quite explain himself or why he's frustrated in terms of the way he acts or the, the direction or the writing in this movie kind of goes all over the place kind of to, it mirrors the mood swings that he has. Um, definitely as someone who is bipolar where it's a super romantic comedy at times. It's sometimes it's a really serious drama and sometimes it's a wacky comedy. Um, it's all over the place, but I think it's a really interesting uh, depiction of kind of just kind of what he's going through. And I think it's a really good um, I got I gained a lot of empathy from watching it, even though if it's not like the most like incredible, like acted or like written thing ever, I gained a lot of perspective from it. So I think there's there's something in there, I think, for a lot of people. Certainly. No, that's that's it sounds like an interesting watch. And it's only 90 minutes as well. So it's definitely a, a one that you're not you're not you're not committing too much to it, but it's, I mean, if you want to go in and, and risk it and kind of try to see something new, it sounds like it, it'd be uh, uh, recommended. Yeah. And it's free. So nothing, no cost to you. So just try it out for sure. Um, so just kind of leaving uh, kind of the streaming talk. I know that you're pretty hyped to talk about some of the things you've been watching on uh, the criterion channel. I know that you, uh, just kind of following your letterbox and seeing some of the logs. It looks like you've been getting into uh, David Lynch lately. Um, that's fun. So, uh, what, what have you seen? What, what have you been watching? Yeah. So I had never seen a David Lynch movie before. Uh, so it was a def- a huge hole in my just movie watching life. And I was like, what better time than now to kind of get into it? Um, so it seemed like a lot of people say that Twin Peaks is a good entry point for David Lynch. And I'm kind of allergic to TV just because I don't feel like spending that much time with something. <laughs> I like my good 90 minute movies and then I can move on with my life. Um, so it seemed like the kind of like the, the movie, the movie that everyone suggests you start with is blue velvet. So I started there and this movie is insane. Um, but also just terrific. And Dennis Hopper is, I mean, if people who are hearing this and have seen the movie, um, they they know that Dennis Hopper is just, just on one (laughs) in this movie. Um, he's basically, he's basically like a combination of Freud and Oedipus complex and, so there's a lot of let's say, masochism in there as well. It's just he's just a a big ball of just sex and <laughs> and he just like convulses and just yells like fuck every like three words. <laughs> uh, there's one of my favorite. I think one of my favorite lines in movie history now is um, there's a whole bit in this movie kind of about what beer people like to drink. Um, and so Kyle MacLachlan, the lead character, um, Dennis Hopper asks him like, oh, what beer do you like? And he's like, oh, Heineken. And he's like. He's like, he's like, what? No, fuckwad, like Pabst Blue Ribbon. <laughs> just like yells Pabst Blue Ribbon so loud. And it's my favorite thing ever. Um, <laughs> but yeah, David Lynch, uh, I'm happy. I'm finally into it. And I'm so fascinated by his work already. And Blue Velvet is just very strange um, in so many ways, but just really interesting. Um, yeah, and from there, I cracked open the Criterion Channel for the first time and watched Eraserhead. Um which has just made me sick and sick to my stomach. I never want to have kids again or again, geez, I've never had kids. <laughs> <laughs> like um, I, it just made me just feel so gross. and want to make me take a shower. Um, I'm happy. I finally watched it. Cause it's kind of one of the big, um, so it's like, it's one of the big kind of rite of passages for just surreal art house cinema. Um, it's mm-hmm. one, like, kind of one of the big ones you have to cross off your list. And I'm finally happy I watched it, and it's it's really terrific. And I recommend, obviously, it's, it's a classic movie, but I recommend anyone give it a shot because you're going to have a strong reaction to it, just no matter if you hate it or you love it or whatever, because there's just so much just strong imagery going on. 
Um, I think it's brilliant um, and really fascinating, and there's a lot to pick out there. Um, so have you ever watched David Lynch? I don't know if you're a big Lynch no, head. Never, never. I mean, that's – I mean, he, he's on the list. Um, actually, what I wanted to get into a little bit was – I'm planning to dive a little bit more into Noah Baumbach's uh, filmography in the coming uh, days. Um, but no, David Lynch is definitely someone that I've, I've, I've been wanting to get into. Uh, he's a very interesting guy. I've listened to him speak a lot. And uh, he, he seems very, uh, very interesting just listening to him talk. And obviously, he's just got so many uh, absolute hits when it comes to um, art house uh, films. And it, he's a neat director, too, because I, I don't think he has... Um, I, I Like, he, he's... I mean, he's on the level in terms of just critical reception and in terms of his status in terms of uh, art house movie going moviegoers. He's on a different level for sure, but he just doesn't seem synonymous with um, some of the other directors that have just been so successful over the last few decades. I think he's kind of in this weird spot. Do you uh, agree at all? Or Yeah, because I mean, from what I've seen and kind of what you hear from just reading stuff on him and also just from hearing him talk, he's kind of an uncompromising dude. So like, he's not going to make like, like fast and furious 10. Like that's just not in his DNA. He wants to do something that's so off the wall. Um, And he's kind of in that mode where he might be a little too expensive for a lot of studios to float that cash to him. uh, Cause he hasn't made a film in a while. Um, He actually, I'm actually going to watch it probably maybe today, but there's a short film of his that was released on Netflix like a month or two ago um, called Yeah, What Would Would Jack Do? Where it's like him as like a noir detective talking to a monkey with like a human mouth, which looks really funny to me. Um, But yeah, it seems like he's not like, like he might not make another film, which is kind of weird. And I feel like he is stuck in that mode where um, I love the films I've seen and he's praised by basically everyone who's really kind of takes like film seriously. But yeah, I don't think he'll, he'll, he'll never make like that $50 million, maybe like that Goodfellas type of thing with Scorsese or just anything like those where everyone can watch and get something out of it. Like he just has such a, such a distinct vision where he's just not, he's not going to censor himself at all for anybody. And, and in a lot of ways I appreciate that because he's created some of like, I mean, just these two films I've seen just, they're just so off the wall and so iconic and like visionary um so i kind of appreciate that he's kind of stuck to his guns here but i would like to i would like to see like a24 or like neon or like one of these like trendy studios just like throw him like 10 million dollars like and just be like hey do whatever you want we'll see you when the movie's over like good luck (laughs) type of thing like i feel like that's the only way he would make a movie now um and i hope so that he i hope that happens for him yeah no for sure um so Kind of what I wanted to get into is what we're also planning to watch in the coming days, and obviously you're you're probably going to continue with uh, some of the Lynch, uh, David Lynch bin, uh, binge watching. Um, but for me, I, as I said, I wanted to watch a little bit more of Noah Baumbach because Marriage Story was actually my uh, introduction to him. I had never seen one of his films before, um, and I, I really enjoyed the movie. But I don't think I'm uh, in love with him as a filmmaker yet, just because I don't know. His, his style enough just based off the one film so uh squid and a whale and then the meyerwitz stories are the next two on my list meyerwitz is uh one that i've been wanting to watch for uh so long but i've just never gotten around to it i know you've seen uh both and i, I think you like both but um I, i'm just looking forward to checking those out in the coming days yeah i i really love noah bombach i feel like something about him like a lot of his movies are kind of like weird very comfortable to me um like it's just really good dialogue really sharp and like Squid in the Whale is like 83 minutes like it's just perfect like it's in and out and I I love my short movies because the one (laughs) the one thing you'd ever say about a 90 minute movie was like damn that was too long like you just you're in and out it's perfect Um, I really like Squid in the Whale a lot and there's a really there's a really good um, there's a lot of great performances in that movie Um, I also recommend Francis Ha I believe that's still on Netflix at least it's here in the US Um, that's I feel like I mean that was a lot of people have kind of called that one as you can tell he's falling in love with Greta Gerwig on screen in that movie. Um, and that's just, it's probably like the best thing that both of those people have done. Maybe, well, maybe not Greta Gerwig cause she's made two incredible movies, but um, yeah, it, he's, I, he, there's still a couple holes with him. I need to watch, uh, see as well. Um, but a lot of this, a lot of stuff I have seen from him, is just delightful. And I've seen, I've watched Meyerowitz on Netflix like five times. <laughs> I love that movie. I mm. love it. It's a great, um, kind of 
not talked about enough uh, Sandler serious performance. He's just so good in that movie. Ben Stiller is great in that movie as well. Um, Dustin Hoffman is great too. There's just so much great stuff in that movie uh, that I just love returning to it. Um, yeah, you really can't go wrong there. He's terrific. Good. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and then just kind of straying away from capital C cinema and something else that I was going to watch <laughs> soon. Me and my sister split um, the costs for Disney Plus and uh, – I, I haven't watched a ton of stuff on it yet. Um, a couple of things here and there, a couple of Pixar movies, a couple of old Disney classics, but I, I, I don't know if I can get into the Mandalorian yet. Um, but what I am going to watch actually is probably not the first thing that everyone would run to on Disney plus, but as a kid, I, I fell in love with this franchise and I'm going to watch, I mean, the, the, the fifth one pretty bad. The fourth one, not that good either, but I will, uh, defend to the death all three of the uh, first three Pirates of the Caribbean movies. <laughs> uh, um, I think the first one is Lightning in a Bottle. And my whole life, I've actually preferred the second one to the first one. But I think upon rewatch, I might have to, uh, who knows, maybe I'll change my views. It's just been so long since I've watched them all. But I remember always loving the second one. I think even it, it's a franchise that looking back on today, it is low key kind of the blueprint for a lot of modern day franchises. Um, it had the post credit scenes, right? It had that sort of stuff. It had it before Marvel did it. Um, the CGI on, uh, in, in the second film on Davy Jones with his uh, tentacle looking face is still better than a lot of the CGI you see today. And the first film I think is just, I mean, two through five, take it or leave it. There are a lot of people that don't like a lot of the sequels, especially five. I don't think anyone likes five. Um, but the first one is, is one that is like your, your blueprint summer blockbuster. Somehow it turned out to be fantastic. So I, I hope to, that's the childhood franchise I'm going to jump back into. Yeah. I, my, I am kind of tainted by watching the last movie. Cause my, my lasting memory of the, this franchise is just like fighting to fall, to not fall asleep watching the fifth one because it was just so boring and like just it was just up just like doing that's the same shtick over and over again and it was just so tiring <laughs> so no, I, I feel like that i feel like that has i think that definitely has like colored a lot of people's perspectives on those couple those first couple movies because um i can't i mean i haven't seen two and three in a while or so i can't really like I remember like liking them when I was littler, but I can't really say if they're like quote unquote good movies. But there's a lot of good stuff in there, like especially that end battle sequence in the third one, and like the in the water is just terrific. And like I feel like Gore Verbinski is a really interesting director that I don't feel like doesn't get enough credit, um, and he does a lot of cool stuff and like a lot of inventive stuff there. But yeah, I would like to revisit those as well. I think there's stuff there that we aren't giving them credit for. No, for sure. I mean, the first one got a lot of love. Of um... Even at awards bodies, the first one got a, a lot of love, but really the sequels kind of, there was some decline there, especially four and just five. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's got awful, but, uh, <laughs> uh, I just, I just loved Davy Jones as a kid. So I always loved the second one more, but the first one has that magic to it that like when, when you talk about movie magic, that's one of the films I think of the parts of the Caribbean curse of the black pearl. Um, but besides that, I think that's, um, pretty much it for the weekend um i don't know what's coming out in terms of netflix originals next week but we will be back talking about that um but for you are you just gonna con kind of continue that uh, david lynch watching throughout the week yeah lynch uh, i I'm, i want to check out murder party you ever hear of that movie it's the <laughs> <laughs> so it's a it's jeremy uh Saun saunier's uh debut so he's gone on to do a uh, green room and blue ruin which is one of the best thrillers of the 2010s um, and get that Netflix movie, Hold the Dark, as well. Um, he's done, he did a few episodes of True Detective as well. Um, I feel like he's kind of one of the guys to watch for this uh, next decade. I feel like he could make a movie like that really like puts him in a new stratosphere of, of uh, directors. I think a lot of the stuff he does is just terrific. So I want to check out his weird uh, debut from t 2007, where it's, it's like 77 minutes long. Guy just it's kind of the title is self-explanatory guy shows up to like a warehouse and there's a murder party so great it's interesting that's, that's <laughs> cool <intriguing>. stuff <laughs> it's intriguing it's 77 minutes so that's right up uh, right up your alley that's what you like yeah, it's beautiful <laughs> it's beautiful stuff i love it for sure but uh, as always you can uh, check out more movie babble content on our instagram facebook twitter uh, check us out at moviebabblereviews.com and uh, we'll be back next week uh, thanks nick and uh, hope you have a great week